Good evening, everyone. We are live on Our Being in New England. Must be Wednesday night, must be 7 o'clock, and you must be John DePietro. So b before you give me the time out sign, and I, and I disrespect you by not even introducing you tonight, I'll do it first, because actually you have the best-looking studio tonight. Yeah. You know, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. However, I need to tell you that this is not what it was planned, and the life of an, RV, of an RVer is based upon what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, and don't worry, we'll get it done anyway. And Bob, for the almost three years we've been doing this show, we have done it from locations all over, all over the world for that fact. In fact, I think one night you were in Italy, I was in Canada, and our guest was on the West Coast. So we've made it happen. But however, today was a little bit different. Um, I was at Cape Cod in Hyannis, and I left there. Before you do that, we should at least recognize that our guest, Chris Doherty, is here. So, Chris, if you'll indulge, indulge us for just a little bit, John's going to tell a quick story as to where, why he is where he is. Chris is in the house. So here's what happened. Um, usually it's two hours from Hyannis to Worcester. But today um, I noticed unusually heavy traffic on Route 6 and realized traffic was stopped when it shouldn't be on a Wednesday, middle of the week, noontime. As it turned out, there was a major car truck accident that closed the bridge. It took us five hours to get over the bridge. Now, normally in two hours, I can do 110 miles back to Worcester. So what I did when I realized that, um, you know, you don't want to do a show from the rest area of an interstate highway. So I called our friends. I called Pete Daly at Circle CG Farm in Bellingham and said, Pete, I need you, but all I need is um, a place to pull off the road to do our show at 7 o'clock. I'll tell you this. Not only did he stay fine, he gave us a spot. We've got power. We've got, um, you know, water, sewer, et cetera. We're only going to stay an hour because we've got to get back to Worcester. But if you're looking for a great place that's not too far from Boston, Providence, or Worcester, Circle CG Campground in Bellingham is that and you can see we've got uh, as chris who's our weatherman uh told us we've got <laughs> severe thunderstorm warning coming i've got my awning on our brand new vita out and we've got the awning light special thanks to the engineers at winnebago that knew that we'd be needing this tonight so with that being said this this, this may be a first for you. wait this may be a first for you though because you are not a man that put out an awning you're right you're right but this yeah. awning is electric so you just press the button and it pops right out and then you push that light can you see that you can see the light in the camera up there right mm -hmm. sure um yeah yeah you know etc so i'm so bad when it comes to that that we've had our other unit for 10 years i've never put the awning out so uh i just don't want to get really? something out so look at look at this we got people from north carolina we got people from texas we got people from um brockton i don't know we don't know where walter is we think walter's home right now um, and is I, in, I don't know. I, if he, I don't know if he just came home for a couple of days to do the rentals and then head back on the road, or if he's. Uh, I mean, one of these days he's got to go back to work, I guess. But we're welcome, gonna, Chris Barney. Glad to have you back on the show. Glad to be here. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, so I met I met Nerve the North up in Old Lodgett Beach, Maine. We got John on the road, and, and you're in a brand new house in Springfield. So yeah, all new surroundings this time around. <laughs> Yep. No, absolutely. And uh, uh, here, here he goes. Here he goes with his time out. So here's the thing, Chris. I usually bring I usually bring law and order to this show. The okay. Thing, you know he can say Chris Doherty. He can show the trailer life, um, motorhome, other stuff. The thing that that we don't say and it doesn't really show up in any of the publicity that we do pre-show is that Chris is one of the nicest guys in the RV business, and we've had an opportunity to to um, have some chicken wings at the 99 and some popcorn mm -hmm. at the 99 with them. And, pre COVID. Um, pre COVID, right, right, exactly. But Chris is one of the nice guys in the business. So it's a pleasure to have him on the show. Number one, because he's a nice guy. And number two, he knows a whole lot of everything about anything to do with RVing. So Chris, um, welcome and thank you for taking time from your valuable, valuable time from your busy day to be with us. My pleasure, John. Thank you. Yeah, you, you, John, you, 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 you. Huh? 
I was just saying to John, if the wind picks up and it starts to storm, get that awning in and get back inside. I will be doing so. When thunder roars, go indoors. When thunder roars, go indoors. Right. Right. All right. So we got we got Frank Case with us. He's uh, up there enjoying his airstream. I hope looking for some new adventures and to learn a few things. Maria Delante Moore. Good evening, Maria. Audrey Foley Egan. Glad to have you on, Audrey. Early tonight. Mark Polk is on. Hi, Mark. Lisa Warren from RV USA today. Hi, Lisa. Ronnie Layberger from Brad RV Swenson from Mass Good Sam. Uh, the Cavosas, somebody from the Cavosas. Um, uh oh, Maria says it's thunder, thundering in Hubbardston. Hubbardston. Okay. Yeah. So we got a little and bit Walt, of time. Paul is working from home, and God Pat Hawes is on, and Don is going to be our guest next week. I'll go into that later on. Steve Piano's here. All right. So, Chris, so, Bob, Bob, stop. One, to, Bob, 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 Bob. Bob. More, more important question than whatever you're saying, mine's more important right now. Chris, have you ever been on a show where we where the audience gets introduced as well? No, no. Not only by name, well, but by their affiliation with the RV. <laughs> we are the only show so. in America that the studio audience gets introduced. Bob, did you know that? What 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 other television show does that? No, right. It's almost like the Family Feud. Okay, right. You know, and once so once in a while, Richard Dawson recognized somebody out in the yeah. audience. I'm dating yeah. myself a little bit, I guess. Well, Bob does look a little bit like Steve Harvey with that. Uh, oh, he does that, that head, <clears throat> that shiny head. So, uh, so, so what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, we got a whole bunch of things to talk about. Yeah, we talked earlier, and, and Chris John was interested, and I am too. What's your take? This influx of all these new RV is coming into the industry, and it's getting a lot of write-ups. And uh, even Bob Bob Wheeler mentioned it in a big national uh, interview that he did with Business Insider. He's the CEO of Airstream mm -hmm. about some of the things that Airstream is doing, recognizing that we're putting a lot of people out there in RVs and in campgrounds that don't know a damn thing about what they're doing. Well, that's the the concern that happens every time we have an influx of, of new uh, newbie RVers. And so there's a lot of resources out there for them to learn how to do um, everything the right way. Uh, certainly they like to ask other RVers how to do things, uh, but there needs to be education out there, uh, teach people how to do it, uh, do it well, do it safely. It improves the RVing experience uh, for sure. So um, that's what uh, publications like ours uh, tries to do and resources like RV Education 101 um, and some of the, uh, there's some other groups out there that are doing uh, RV uh, education today. And so it's <clears throat> good to, to see that. Uh, we just need to get the word out so people know they have a resource. You know, it's, it's kind of one of those things, you know, somebody gets a big yacht, they kind of have to spend some time with it and, uh, uh, you know, to learn how to be a captain. And so when you have your RV, there's things you need to learn so that you can enjoy the experience and have just a, a, a good time and you have know, your RV last a while. Chris, you're, you're absolutely correct. And Jerry brought up a very good point. It's not just the newbies that are clueless. Now, we've been RVing for 13, no, 17 years, 17 years. And today, as I was stuck in that traffic near, actually near majors, um, I had a light come on, a yellow light on the dashboard that said um, refill additive. Refill additive. What the hell does that mean? I, there's so many things that add. So I go to the owner's manual because I couldn't That's access it, even though the owner's manual is on, on the dash. In the, when I'm driving, I don't have access to it. So my wife gets me the owner's manual out, and because... And I said this to Bob, be ready. This is a this is a unit that Winnebago provided for us, but it's got Canadian um, markings. You know, it's got uh, not centigrams, what do you call them? Uh, kilometers per hour, et cetera. And the temperature is in centigrade, not in Fahrenheit. Um, so I go get the owner's manual out. Guess what? It's in French. <laughs> <laughs> So somewhere I was able to read DEF, you know, which is what mm -hmm. diesel emission fluid. And fluid, yeah. before I left on the trip, I picked up two and a half gallons and had it with me. So I had to put, but 
if I was not an RVer, um, you know, if I was a newbie, there are some scary things that could happen. Um, scary and dangerous. Absolutely. You know, it's like any any operating machine. Uh, there are a lot of systems involved. There's fuels involved, energy involved. Um, you release that energy uncontrolled, and uh, you can have problems. So, you know, I, I, I tell people in seminars and, and articles, everything else, your owner's manual is your best friend. I know a lot of people, they, they just ignore it. I've seen people throw it right in the trash. Um, <laughs> but you know what? It is, um, it is your best friend. You know, take it out and read the thing. Would you agree with me, Chris, that... Um, and we had this happen with some friends that we've introduced to three or four families into the RVing uh, lifestyle in the past few months. In fact, in this spot right here at Circle CG, we brought some people a month or so ago for the first out uh, for the first outing. Mm -hmm. um, if you bring your new RV home, whether it's a travel trailer or motorized or whatever, and you say, I'm not going anywhere until I memorize these owner's manuals, you could get paralyzed would you would you agree with me on that you yeah won't go, you won't be going but you're going to the other extreme john you know saying <laughs> right. okay i'm going to take this owner's packet out and i and i remember monaco's country coaches things like that that had two big accordion folders you know plus some big books uh you know it's extreme no doubt about it don't have to memorize it Go through it, be familiar with it, and then when you see something, and if you don't remember what it is, you'll know where to look for it. Hmm. Uh, you know to get the information that you need. Hmm. Uh, but at least you've gone through it. Most of us, the owner's packet's not that um, difficult to to get to know. But especially something like a chassis, like you're looking at, you know, it's a diesel. Uh, you have to use diesel exhaust fluid. There's other things you need to know about a diesel engine if you've never owned one. Uh, you know, maintenance things and how to run it and uh, uh, and things like that that you really need to be familiar with. Uh, on that DEF stuff, Chris, if you don't add it, will the engine just shut down? Uh, what happens if, if you don't? Because I, I remember one of the ones I tested last year, I got mileage notifications, you know, in 200 miles or 100 miles. Yeah. You got that, John? And then, so what, what happens if you get to zero and they say, hey, stoop, you didn't put the stuff in, and I'm going to shut the unit down? It'll go. It, it'll start by going into a limp mode, usually. Yep. Five miles an hour. Um, yeah. And then, yep. uh, so it gives you enough to pull over, basically. And uh, the problem is that the exhaust system can get all plugged up, and then you can have a, a, a real hazard on your hands, not to mention mm. destroying a $5,000 exhaust system. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, yeah, so I don't think Winnebago. I don't think Winnebago would appreciate us if we did yeah. that. No, you know what? I told yeah. Bob today. I said, "Look, just go to uh, go to your local RV dealer and um, buy. Cut, they come in two and a half gallon containers, and they're set up that the uh, light only comes on when there are two and a half gallons available. So you're not. It's not like a quart of oil. You put in a half a quart. I mean, you put the whole thing in, and." Uh, and then you're ready for, I think, another 3,000, 4,000 miles or so. Chris, let me ask you this question. Now, I'm in a campground right now, and as I look around, I see there's a large number of seasonal people based upon, you know, the stuff that they're carrying. Mm -hmm. But um, as a professional RVer, as we are, how do, how do you spot trouble or confusion with a newbie at a campground? What, what, what's one of the, uh, the warning signs, if you will, that uh, this person might need your assistance? A half an hour and they haven't backed into the site yet. Yeah. <laughs> or they're yelling. They're yelling at each other. Uh, they're so yelling at each uh, other. Um, trying to figure out how to get in there. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if they're, you know, kind of, you, you see people scratching their head, trying to figure stuff out. And I mean, to some extent, you want to, people need to learn how to do stuff. And I know, I've, you know, if I was struggling with something, uh, eventually I figure stuff out. Some people don't. Uh, but you know, if you if you see someone just doing something really bad, they're taking their water hose. Okay, I got to hook the water hose up, and they're putting it in the black tank flush. Um, you know, yeah, once yeah. you turn that on, about ten yeah. minutes later, it's going to you know blow up the, the rig. So, um, you know, you want to make sure you know you, you can kind of keep an eye on it. You can always ask somebody, hey, do you need a a, a hand, or you know, I'm from Good Sam or whatever. And, you know, do, are you you know brand new to this? Sometimes you'll still see stickers on the outside of the rig, you know, the stock stickers or something. Yeah. And it'll be like, yeah. 
Yeah, that's brand new. Right. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's, it's amazing the number of people that drive. Our friends who've had it for a year, they still have the stock number on that sticker, you know, with the UPC code um, over the windshield. I said, you know what? You've had it for a year. Why don't you take the darn sticker off? <laughs> and, and he said, that this way here, I can identify it as mine. Um, so what would you definitely say you see one of those newbies at a campsite and you're walking your dog or something like that? As a friend and as a volunteer, is there anything that you would definitely not do when helping them? Because if you screwed it up, you'd cause irreparable harm. It's something you'd not do. Um, yeah, yeah, he knows what he's doing. Uh, he, he wouldn't cause the harm. You and I would cause the, the right. irreparable harm. Yeah, it reminds me of that insurance ad that they've got on now. You know, where you know you're becoming your parents. And there's the guy who's back, you know, the guy sits there and he's doing this, backing the guy out of his parking spot, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it's, yeah, sometimes you can, it, it's possible to do things that just make the situation a little bit more complicated. Okay. Um, so it's better to ask, hey, can I give you a hand with something? And if they need it, great. If not, that's okay, too. You know, they'll, okay. they'll figure it out. Okay, so Randy, Randy had asked a question about a diesel and you answered it in, in the conversation. But one of the things you wanted to bring to our attention tonight is we actually have, I don't know, is this a new chassis or is it an improved chassis? This is all new. So this is the new 2020 Ford F53 uh, gas motorhome chassis. Okay. Yeah. And it's gas. Yep. And so uh, they're building on this now. So you're going to start seeing these arriving in dealerships anytime if they're not already there. Um, during COVID, I talked to a couple of manufacturers that were just starting to get a couple of them across their line. So, Chris, uh, they've been building on Fords for ages. What is different and special about this one? It's a whole new design. So it starts out with a, uh, a new um, uh, motor. And so this one is a 7.3-liter uh, uh, gas engine. It's a brand new one that they um, uh, have released for um, 2020, and it is, but it is staying with the uh, the same um, transmission that they've been doing. So it's a six-speed uh, transmission. In the Ford Super Duty pickups, they're doing a 10-speed uh, transmission as an option. So what else you're going to see in this that's going to be noteworthy? Uh, there, there's quite a quite a bit that's different about it. One of the things you're going to see is a whole new steering column and new instrument cluster. So uh, what they've done is upgraded it, and you're actually getting the Super Duty, um, uh, the last uh, version of the Super Duty uh, steering column uh, from uh, the uh, 2011 to 2016 uh, Super Duties. Um, it, it, there's uh, more electronics in this one, so you're going to have some more smart technology. This will actually have internet uh, access built in, so it will uh, have a, just like uh, this Mercedes has internet yep. built in. Yeah. Yep. So this uh, Ford is going to that platform throughout uh, the fleet, so all of their vehicles will be internet connected. Uh, and what it's going to allow them to do is actually flash um, the computers uh, remotely. So if they have an update, they'll be able to do that. Um, there's probably plenty of other things that they can uh, do through that. But um, so it's something I'm looking forward to, to getting my hands on here at some point, giving it uh, a run, uh, you know, out on the highway and you know try to play with it, see what uh, see what it's all about. Should be a little quieter than the V10. It'd be a lot uh, more comfortable though with an RV built around it though, rather than drive out with one of those things. Well, you know, usually it's a it's a it's a wooden box, see, mm -hmm. that just sits where the seat would go, and then you get on that and you can drive it around the yard, see. Right. So we're gonna do this on classes and class A's. I'm sorry, say that again. Are we gonna see it on class C's and class A's? No, not just C's. Class, a. class C is so class C is a van cutaway, and right. those have also been redesigned for 2020. Um, okay, this is this is sort of the class A product. It's, it's a just a only, right? The kids can see, Bob, because it, it would have the front end different. Well, I, I didn't know if they built it under that front. I didn't know if they were putting it under that same van uh, configuration. No. No, this is 
This is called a strip chassis, uh, which you can see here. And um, if you're looking at a, uh, a Class C, uh, that's what's called a van cutaway chassis. Yeah. And they basically do the thing all the way up through your super C's, you know, so they'll take a, right. an international or Freightliner chassis. And they just take the back wall off the cab and then build a coach onto it. It's the same basic idea. So, so what we'll from a consumer, you know, from a consumer standpoint, when they're shopping, going back to this fact that we have buyers that don't know anything about RVs, what, how does a consumer tell if this new Class A they're looking at has this chassis, and why would they want this? Other than you know, new technology and stuff, how do they uh, look for this to find manufacturers that are building on it? So. Um they're all going to be switching to it. So as they use up their existing inventory, uh, they're going to um, be uh, switching over to this. Okay. So Chris, is this similar to the, the Sprinter conversion when it went from the 18 to the 19 or 19 to the 20? Yeah, it's similar, you know, it's updates. Uh, this one is a little bit bigger update. So this has a lot more, um, uh, a lot more going on. Are, are um, they are they touting um, drivability, ease ease of driving that it doesn't have the truck feel? It know? has. Uh, it's gonna. The, so the new one uh, has a little bit more uh, wheel cut uh, in the front end. So you, it's a forty or a fifty degree wheel cut. So maneuverability is going to be a little bit better with this one. Hmm. Um, and they, there's a one of the things with motorhome chassis. If you go and you look at um, Ford and, and you look at the specs for these things, there's actually a lot of options that a motorhome manufacturer can order on these and a lot of them don't. Uh, so uh, it just, it, it's going to kind of depend what the motorhome builder wants in the chassis. They spec the chassis that they're, that they're bringing along, in. Along those lines, mm -hmm. do the do, does Ford ever tout accessibility to the engine for service? as a feature because every dealer I, I know always says, you know what, great engine, but you got to be a contortionist to be able to uh, to get in there to do anything with. I mean, you're shaking your head already. Yeah, that's all about the bodybuilder uh, in, in, in all reality. It's because you're building the body of the uh, motorhome around the power plant, around the chassis. So think of, think of your vehicle like a tractor. And so you have this, these frame rails and the wheels and the engine and your steering wheel, and that's your motive power. And the thing is, the, the, the tractor, as it were, it was designed to do certain work. And so this particular one, when they get it, it's, this, it's what you're looking at on the screen here. It's a stripped down, um, uh, you know, basically like a tractor. Yeah. And they're going to build the body on it, and they, there's a, a bodybuilder's guide that Ford has that tells the engineers at your coach builder what they can put on it and how they how they attach to it. Um, so yeah. they'll take that, they'll build a saddle frame around it. That's where that will be your platform for your floor. It'll contain the tanks, your storage underneath, all that sort of thing, and then um, uh, and then they build the coach up from there. So basically, the only thing you're getting from the manufacturer is the speedometer, the odometer, the RPMs, the, um, For you know, not even the radio, right? I mean, no, no, no radio, no, nope. is is put on by the, uh, by whether it's the Newmar, whether it's Winnebago, whether it's uh, Grand Design or not, not to say Grand Design because they're not a, I mean, not a motorhome people, but, um, uh, so this is going to be quote unquote revolutionary. Well, it's it's a it's a whole new design. It's gonna uh, it has a lot of new features uh, built into it. Um, we'll see. You know, we'll see how it is. It should be a little bit better uh, drive. You know, the the last version of this chassis goes back to the 1990s, so it hasn't really how long they were. Yeah, it hasn't seen a lot. Um, there's new suspensions that they can put on here. Uh, you know, for uh, uh, an added cost. Um, so there's there's a lot of different things that can be done uh, for manufacturers that want to uh, want to pick it up. So you, you can see the difference, the vast difference in the front end of the Mercedes product. Um, you know, yeah, where it awesome. even looks small, looks 
much less truckish than uh, than its predecessor. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a class C, so it's it's totally different from that from that perspective. So we've seen now, you know, the the top end gas class A's are up around two hundred thousand dollars list price now. So with this new chassis, and if they put a lot of bells and whistles on it. Are we going to break through the two hundred thousand dollar list price for a Class A gas now? Oh yeah, I think they already are. I think they have been. Uh, your higher yep. end uh, gas coaches, I think they've been had MSRPs that high. I you right. know obviously. MSRPs right right. Okay, let me uh, do a quick catch up here. Make sure we're not leaving anybody out in the woods. Maria says, "What's nice is a lot of the places you stop for diesel also have DEF available." That's correct. It's most every one of them, they have to almost have to have it. Um, Frank says, "Yeah, for for trailers in forty years, always something to learn. Especially so many high tech systems now in my Airstream trailer. I like simple, but after all, it is twenty twenty. Uh, Frank, did you see the post I put up for Bob Wheeler, the CEO today on Business Insider at the site? Good interview." Um, Maria says, watching them back in. I wish that's still back the other conversation. Nicole Husson. Hope I pronounced that right. She says, a fridge, a fridge stopped working, impossible to find parts. Uh, just type in what kind of fridge you got. See if Chris gave you some notes on that. Don says, that explains why Bob has a seasonal site. I'm not sure what he means there, but... Uh, uh, Jerry says no more B10. Is that true, or the B10 is still going to be in the class C's? B10 is gone. It's all done. Done. All done. Okay. Jerry says, what happened to the freight line of gas chassis? Good question. They showed that at uh, RBX, right? Yep. Um, yeah. They. The last word I had from them because I did. I, I've inquired about it a number of times. Is that they were having difficulty with emission certification? And so there was a chain. There were changes coming to emissions and whatnot, and uh, so they were they were delaying the project a little bit. I think they're probably at the point now where um, they're uh, uh, going to, you know, probably hold uh, uh, hold back on it. But I haven't had any word from from Freightliner recently. COVID. I mean, COVID shut everybody down, messed everybody up. So um, you know, certainly it, it's uh, a different. Uh, you know, sort of situation. Mark Post says the F-53 always had a leaning issue to one side. Do you know if they corrected that? So, uh, Mark, that's a great question. In a lot of cases, what uh, was happening with that, if you had a, um, a Class A motorhome on the F-53 with slide outs on one side of the coach, um, you had extra weight there. And uh, I remember catching, I remember seeing a coach at Monaco one time that, They'd taken the slide outs out and the coach went to the side, just sitting in the bay. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I inquired about that and they said, well, yeah, they shim the suspension so that when the slide outs go back in and it was kitchen slide, so it's heavy, uh, it would bring it uh, back level. So it just, it, it's kind of a fine thing whether they end up doing something like that or not. Now, yeah. as far as turning it and that kind of thing, um, yeah, there's there and there's been a lot of aftermarket improvements uh, to go on there for that. Uh, you can get uh, different sway bars um, to to help lock it down. Um, there's a product out there, and it's uh, this is now available directly from Ford if the coach manufacturer wants to order. It's called Liquid Springs, and um, I'm not going to go into a, a big thing because of time, but uh, that actually works very, very well. If you go to uh, motorhome.com and look up the Fleetwood Bounder, in fact, I think it's the lead story. We tested it in Florida just before the coronavirus thing. And uh, I've tested a couple of times before, but it, it works very, very well. So, Chris, I also did some extensive research on that same question because Mark Polk brought that up to me last time we were together in, uh, I think it was in Hershey last year, about that leaning issue. So I did some extensive research, and here's what I found out. It leans to the side that the heavier person is sitting on. Is that uh, okay? Yep. Yep. There you go. Right, right, right from the expert. That yep. Especially if you, if you especially, weigh 250 and your wife weighs 110, it's going to tilt more to your side. So 
you got to put the dogs on her lap and hope that they're big dogs, and then it, then will it be even. That, see, with the liquid spring suspension, you can adjust that right in the dashboard. See, you just hit a couple of buttons, and it goes into sport mode, and, man, I'll tell you what, that thing will be true. It doesn't matter who's sitting on what side of the, the motorhome. Zagami has as a, as a patent now that he's going to have Jack Daniels in those liquid spring suspensions that, <laughs> that have a um, – a little so button for yeah. your glass right on the dash. You never There's have to pour another. <laughs> All right, Chris Andrew just joined us. He's late again because he's making deliveries. Man, hey, you are putting in, he's putting in some serious hours down there in Hemlock. Let me tell you. He, 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 he well must really be looking forward to your, your weekends in the campground these days. John, you better <laughs> be careful. Hey, <laughs> Bob, we need to do our, our like and share thing because of the reason that, you know, in what's happened in Facebook in the last two or three weeks or last three weeks or so is that they've changed the capability to share programs like this to different groups. So what it used to be that when this show was over, we pressed on it and there was a button down below that said share. And then every RV group that I belonged to, which was about 30, I could just hit share, 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 share. And then we could get the seven to 10,000 views because it went out. You know, it's like the paper guy delivering a whole bunch of papers at once. Now they've restricted us to three or four groups and our numbers are a little bit lower, but the content is better. Like tonight's Chris's content is some of the best you're going to find anywhere. So we need you, our audience, our live audience more than ever to hit that share button and send it to somebody who has an interest in RVing, whether they're in it now or whether they're considering it. And as Chris said earlier, if you're going to be a new RVer, there is a huge learning curve and there's no better place to learn about new RVs than on this particular show. And uh, besides, um, the hosts are nice guys and the guests are even better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, not, they're not bad looking either. Right. You know? Easy on the eyes. Chris, this one intrigued me when you sent this over. Uh, seeing that I'm not mechanically inclined, I do know it's a generator. Mm. And I do know how to spell generator. <laughs> and I do know the button that allows me to turn on the generator. Mm -hmm. That's where that's where my knowledge is. So why put this one in the mix tonight and what do you like about it? Well, uh, so I'm, I'm going to tease an article that's coming out in the September issue of Trailer Life. Uh, we got an opportunity. Okay. To test a couple so of these. Tell a few more. Tell a few more magazines. That's okay. Yeah, that's I know, I know. Well, uh, you know what? I think a lot of people are subscribers anyway, are getting it, so uh, they'll see this. Um, this is kind of fun uh, because uh, it Onan uh, Cummins Onan has finally come back to the portable generator market, which means they're able to. Uh, service RVers anywhere from a uh, teardrop all the way up to a 45 foot bus uh, and uh, uh, in their RV line. And so these these are pretty good. These are, are called inverter generators. And a lot of the portables today are uh, Hondas, Yamahas, uh, um, Champion, there's, there's uh, Energizer, geez, there's a bunch of them. And so the neat thing about uh, inverter generators is that they give very clean power uh, today's electronics need clean power. And so that's what an inverter generator will do for you. Plus it's also generally quieter. And in the case of these guys, they have, um, uh, variable speed engines. So the motor will change RPMs. It keeps it quieter and more efficient. I need to interrupt you there because I know I'm going to ask a question that many people are thinking the same thing, but because, because I'm here, I'll ask you. A generator, an inverter generator. What is the difference? So a generator, the uh, motor um, turns a, uh, a, a uh, an alternator unit, basically a generator unit that provides AC power. And in order to do that, it has to, and to, to provide um, the proper power at the proper frequency, uh, it has to turn at a constant RPM. Okay, so that's why they're, they, they tend to be much louder. Okay. With an inverter generator, the, the, the motor uh, does create AC power, but it goes through a rectifier that turns it into direct current. And then that goes into an inverter that then brings it back to 120 volt, 60 hertz AC electric 
but it's pure sine wave. There's no artifact from the engine um, and um, no noise, basically. And uh, it's a lot better for electronics, and it, it does make for a better um, better experience. Way above my pay grade, but our audience is smart. Pay attention to Petro. There's going to be a test later on. None so of the, the above. The RVs that are out there now that they have the Honda and Panasonic and all this other stuff, uh, is it worth dumping the old one and getting getting this new technology because of all the new technology that you have on the coach? Yeah. I. You know what? It, it's not just the, the technology on the coach. It's the computers and things you're plugging into it. Um, so like John is out in his coach right now with his, um, with his laptop and in, in broadcasting from there, there's a lot of people today that are out, uh, in the field working with, um, various computers and things like that. So, uh, it definitely can make a difference, uh, Chris, in, as far along, as preserving the equipment. Along those same lines, um, uh, well, be, well, before you say that, that is obviously for a travel trailer, a, a towable. Uh, mobile or truck camper. Yep. Okay. Or your SUV or whatever. What about the people in a uh, motorhome that, uh, so uh, that, that's, a are they making them that will be non portable and give you that same quality or capability? They are. And so, uh, I have the first of, uh, a new line of generators from Onan out in the garage. So we speak, it's called a P 25 or a QG. Uh, 2500i. And so it's a quiet gas. It's a propane uh, built-in generator um, that is a 2500 watt uh, inverter generator. And they are going to, they're starting to release that inverter technology into built-in RV generators. So we're going to be uh, installing that in a, uh, I bought a, an old Lance camper uh, that I'm, that as a little project. And uh, we're going to be changing out the old um, propane generator that's in it which is also an, an older Onan, uh, dating back to 2005. Uh, we're going to be replacing that with this new one. With uh, the new technology one. Yep, and uh, we're going to be doing some testing with it, vibration testing, sound testing, uh, everything that they've come up with on it. Uh, uh, pr you know, it's, it sounds like it's really going to be something a lot quieter, mm -hmm. a lot smoother. Of course, okay. the better power coming off it. Let, let me ask one, one more follow-up question to that. What new technology do you see becoming commonplace in the 2020s and beyond that may present challenges to a newbie or even a seasoned RVer? Um, what, what's the new technology that you see everywhere that could be confusing? Um, probably the multiplexing systems. Uh, you know, somebody who has not worked with that kind of tech before. Um, getting through menus and things like that. They're designed to be very, they're, they're designed to be, um, you know, pretty easy to uh, navigate, but some of the systems can be very complex. So it takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, but, uh, you know, we try to keep a lot of the technology in the RV industry simple. And so, I've, you know, you see a lot of these things that are going to just similar controls and things like that. Um, so it, it's designed to be user friendly. Yeah. Would you agree that not much technology in RVs is is groundbreaking, but more like catch up, catching up as opposed to what you put on a hot dog ketchup? <laughs> uh, no, I. It's more like mustard and relish. Uh, and no, but in all seriousness, um, there's a lot of tech. You know used to be that you'd have tech that started in the higher end of the RV industry and then it kind of worked its way down and, and the multiplexing technology is certainly there. Uh, internet connectivity, being able to use your smart device to, um, you know, get on, uh, you know, to access your coach from anywhere. Uh, you know, these systems right now, they're uh, uh, RVC compatible systems. You can address all kinds of different technology in them. And uh, the, it's, the, the sky's the limit. So you're going to start seeing cam more cameras, alarm systems, all kinds of different things that can work into this, um, into this technology. Uh, but, today's, but today's consumers, look at you guys, you're, you're, you know, we're the three of us are here on computers. We're doing, a, you know, an internet broadcast. I mean, especially you, John, I mean, geez, you, you have a hard time with the light bulb sometimes. I mean, 
Well, and you know what? what? What we're doing right now, when I got into TV back in 1978 at the old Channel 27 in Worcester, it used to take a broadcasting truck bigger than a 40-foot RV out there with those big satellite dishes to do what we're doing right now, which which I could basically do on my phone, sure. which is absolutely amazing. Hey, Jerry, Jerry's got a statement, and I think this is true for the older in uh, generators. Jerry says, also, you can run several inverted generators in parallel. Uh, what does that mean? You can run two. Explain that to people, but it also explain why would you want to do that? Why would you need to do that? So uh, the different manufacturers, and, and I go into this in more detail in the article, so I don't want to you know, spoil everything, of course. But um, when you run generators in parallel, uh, it gives you the opportunity of using portable generators to... Um, provide more watts to run more loads in your RV. And you can adjust what, how many, you know, if you're using, if you have a small one, like a 2,500, and then you have like a 3,500 watt generator, you can pick which one of those you want to use, or if you're really going to be demanding a lot of power, then you can run them in parallel with a parallel kit. And so um, in this particular case, it's computer controlled. So uh, you wire it up the right way. The first generator is taking most of the load, and then the other one decide, uh, you know, realizes, oh yeah, there's more load that we need to to uh, to feed in, and it um, uh, starts adding in its capabilities into the mix. Uh, and we did uh, energizer generator a couple of years ago. Uh, same basic idea, you know, that you can take. Uh, two different generators. They can be the same size. You can have one that's smaller, one that's larger. So if you need a little generator to go out and do a shoot or do whatever, 2,500 watts will do it for you. Take that one, off you go. You know, and uh, if you need more, you I can take that one. Chris, I want to jump back to the Ford engine. I, I pulled this slide off. I was looking at the specs for that uh, new Ford engine, and it's got capability for What's that? Natural Press gas and L gas. Compressed but natural. Are we getting? To, but are we getting to a point where we might see motorhomes using these systems? They're if they're available now on the engine. Is it a year or two away? Will we see? Will we ever see it? Uh, it's been that technology's been around for quite a while, so it's it's right. not it's not new. Uh, it is certainly an option uh, for manufacturers to to do that. Uh, I don't know that there'd be a market for it in RV. They do use the F53 and F59 in commercial um, applications. So uh, your bread trucks, things like that, um, you know, uh, FedEx, different things like that, different vehicles like that can run on the F53 and F59. So uh, okay. that's, a, that's one of those options. Like I said, you can opt in for a whole bunch of different things. Uh, okay. Hey, Bob, before we, before we go any further, I, I, I know that uh, Chris had just mentioned uh, he's got a Lance camper, and um, um, we'll be the first to announce, if people don't already know, that our friend William Hill, who spent many, many years with Lance, he was our rep up in the Northeast area, is now back with Lance. Did you know that, Bob? I did not know that. Breaking William Hill breaking is back with Lance. Uh, he's, he's working out of... I think he's still going to live in Myrtle Beach, but he was working uh, in Florida, and the dealership had some um, COVID issues where they let some, you know, they had to let some management people um, move on, and um, Lance came back after him. And you know what? All the shows that we go to, we go to a lot of shows throughout the year. Um, I'm sure you'd agree, Bob, that um, William was one of the best representatives of his company where um, he knew his product line inside and out, and it's nice to see him back um, representing a manufacturer. Yeah, he, he was certainly one of the top five or ten in the country uh, in terms of representing his product, but, but also the way he could communicate with both the dealers and the consumers. That's why he yep. was so effective at, at the shows. shows. At shows, right. Yeah, he was very effective at the shows, always knew the product, and uh, he... It, you know, if the show closed at six o'clock, he was still there at seven o'clock. He, yeah, he, he wasn't one of the guys heading to the bar at and, four o'clock. You know, and there those guys. The show closes at six, and these guys are heading to the airport at two thirty. Right, right. No. <laughs> William, William, I'm, I'm glad. I, I'm, I'm amazed. How, how did you beat me to that one? Uh, you know, 
I can't yeah. divulge all my sources. Oh, yeah. some, of, some of my smartness must be rubbing off on you. I'm getting scared here. I don't know. Yeah. All right, Chris. We're not we're not on you either. Yeah. Chris, Better not say that. <laughs> you, you put this one in the mix. And I, you know, my, my point on this is I don't know why anybody buys a separate GPS now with all the stuff that's out there and the stuff that's on the phone. So you got, you got to sell me on why somebody would spend $500 for this. Well, um, you know what? The, there are uh, apps and things that are coming out that provide um, special routing for RVs. I get that. Um, and for a long time, uh, routing with a smart device meant you were getting just basic GPS routing. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, one, of, one of the things that's nice about uh, whether it's an app or an RV GPS is being able to uh, use truck routes and it, it will map uh, map you around places you can't fit uh, You know for a time that was a little bit clunky. Uh, it's been getting a lot better uh, they're able to um, uh, You can you can kind of select uh, how um, uh, Picky the machine is uh, about the route that you're going to go on uh, so you can have just plain truck routes, uh, you know, which can take you quite a ways out of the way. Uh, but then you can actually kind of bring that down a little bit. Uh, the nice thing about something like this, and this is Garmin's new RV890, which is a, a, a Android tablet based uh, GPS. You can do all your planning uh, on it. Um, and uh, so you can you can plan your trips between that. You can also go online and 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 download your um, your trip into it. Uh, there's you know the usual stuff that you find on it, right? So your campgrounds and your uh, trip advisor stuff and restaurants and points of interest and all that. It's uh, you know has all that sort of things. Live traffic. Um, hey Chris, along those lines, would you agree that it's important to point out that um, these type of things are valuable not just for bridge clearances, but for also like today. Again, with all that traffic coming off of the Cape, and Jerry will know right on the on the mainland side, uh, the road that goes along the canal, it took me onto another road that really wasn't designed. If I had a Class A motorhome, I would have had trouble because of the way the turns were. So I'm sure that, that you can um, forecast the type of, uh, type of roads that you want, not just bridges, but mm -hmm. country roads versus uh, highways, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, they, uh, Garmin uh, recently sent out a demo unit to take a look at uh, of this new uh, system. And, of course, it's hard to, to look at here. But um, I, I've just started playing with it. I haven't taken any trips with it yet. Uh, I want to get out and, and practice with it some. But uh, it has some extra uh, options and some better uh, software than some of the older models did. Uh, we did a, a big roundup of uh, GPSs in Motorhome Magazine last year um, that uh, um, was very interesting. And uh, Don Smith did it. And he, it was funny. He sent me a picture and he had his SUV and he had gotten GPSs from all these different companies. And he had them lined up across the dashboard over here on the side window. And he had one up here in the sunroof and, and comparing how they all do uh, with routing and and uh, how they uh, are able to receive the GPS signal and whatnot. Uh, Chris, does that sit on your dash, or is it affixed to your windshield, or how, what is the? Uh, you can do. It, they, it comes with a bunch of mounts, so you can kind of do whatever you want. This is uh, uh, this is the mount here for it, um, and it does have a suction cup on the back, and there's an extension, so you can put it on your windshield, or you can put a disc on your dashboard, and this is magnetic. So, you know, when you're, uh, when you're going to go, you just, uh, actually I got to do it the right way. There we go. And just it like just okay. snaps on and, uh, uh, and then you're good to go. And then, so actually it would be kind of sitting like this, all right, on your windshield. And then when you get where you're going and you don't want to leave this on the dashboard, you just peel it off. Pop it right off. Yeah. And that stays on there. Um, and it's got all the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and everything else, so it 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 really is a smart device. The other nice thing about this one is that it it will give you you can either do it in portrait mode or landscape mode. It'll do it'll do either one for you. 
How about an MSRP on that and an MSRP on that uh, inverter generator? You have to look at the articles. Oh, okay. I actually don't know off the top of my head right okay. now, but uh, they definitely were looking at it. And, uh, when, I was, when I was grabbing the pictures today, this one's list price of $499.99. Okay, uh, so the problem as it shows on this particular picture, you know, the nice thing about these types uh, for the RVs are you put in your length and your height and your width, and that matches you up on the roofs, correct? Yep. Yep, and then you there, and there's a lot more, a lot of other things that you can plug into it, uh, and then you can have multiple vehicles. So if you have more than one RV, or you have a car, an RV, and a truck, uh, and you want to bounce back and forth, you can do that. It has the software for all of it uh, in the one uh, device. So you can the well, Walt is going to go out and buy one tomorrow. Then, <laughs> hey, well, does it have a very important feature that it, that I know is coming down the road? But I wonder if it has it. Does it? have a programmable feature that you can pick out vegetarian restaurants only because we know somebody who would who would love that i'm going to say yes okay that was just a joke uh, I want to one, but maybe it has trip advisor and it has, there's some different apps in here you know what while we're going on i'll sit here and just kind of play with it and see if i can make it do that okay uh, so there's, there's on, on bulk. Veg, veggies only Veggies only. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, Jerry says, what trucks have run on propane? Uh, yeah, we knew that on propane yeah, truck, yeah. Walt says, co-pilot app on the phone is good. Jerry Plant says, navigating, planning, and finding campgrounds of four or five different apps yeah. that are out there. That, that's correct. Diane yeah. clearly joined us recently. Hello, Diane and Don. Go ahead. Chris, say so. I was just going to say, yeah, you know, some of the other apps that are out there, Road Trippers, uh, in Togo, they have one, uh, if the Road Trippers app, and then if you get Road Trippers Plus, it has full navigation, RV navigation, um, RV Road Trip. Yeah, there was another one. Uh, oh, Road Trippers is what it's called. Uh, it's part of the Togo group, you know, um, for industries. Uh, what was it? There was another one uh, out there that was doing um, RV specific. GPS, but uh, you, you know, and the other thing too with a smart device, if if it's Road Trippers Plus, it will let you download the maps and store them on your device. So if you have a lot of memory in your smart device, you're good to go. But with a lot of the cell phones, you don't have the maps on the unit. If you lose GPS signal or you lose cellular signal, excuse me, you're yeah. out of business. If you don't have if you don't have a data signal. You're done. You're you're you have to wait till you get back to um, and get a good cellular network to get the map to refresh, especially if you get off route. Yeah. Yeah. And Don, and Don uh, was, it RV RV, trip. was it an RV trip? We just came out with their app so that you can now download the entire trip from the computer onto the smartphone. Also, mm -hmm. we should, um, yeah. maybe it's a good time to ask Walter what what how far along is he progressing with his uh, around the U.S. trip next year, Walter. If you're still here, um, what app are you using to uh, to do that, and how much of your process is completed? And is anything that Chris has brought up here uh, would that make your work easier? Yeah, he did post uh, the latest revision the other day. Yeah, while he's doing that, Chris, I'm, I, we're kind of getting down to the wire here. Sure. But I know you you wanted to talk about what you call the. Uh, Tire debacle. What's going on with tires? I've got one of a blown out one, but uh, what concerns you about tires? Well, you, you, even today, I'm on the, the uh, Montana owner's site. I, I own a uh, Karen and I own a Montana uh, fifth wheel, uh, and uh, I was I, I get emails from the Montana Owners Club, and uh, there were a couple of people on there that had blowouts today. You know, and so they're asking questions. One of them was a brand new RV. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, concern and question out questions out there. You go out online, people are talking about China bomb tires and this and that, um, you know, and you lose a tire. And this is, you know, sometimes what you end up with, sometimes better, sometimes worse. Um, it can cause a lot of damage to the RV. And say so when you lose a tire, you lose a lot more than the tire. You yeah, you can, you can absolutely. So we used to get them into the dealership, uh, 
Uh, we had one uh, that was cut out of Ohio on the mass bike and lost a tire, didn't know it, and the carcass wrapped around the spring hanger and ripped it from the uh, frame, ripped a hole in the frame, actually ripped a chunk of the frame right out of the trailer. It was a, a newer travel trailer, and we ended up rechassising it uh, up at Diamond. They Lippert sent a whole new chassis, and we lifted the whole body off the chassis and, and, and replaced it. So there's a lot of a lot of energy that can happen there. Um, you know, I can't answer for tire manufacturers, anything like that. I know there's a lot of concern out there um, uh, about it, but there's some things that people can do to help prevent blowouts. First thing is know how much your RV weighs, okay? Uh, and if, you, if you're lucky enough to, to weigh your RV by wheel position, great. Uh, you should do that to make sure that you're not overloaded on any wheel position. But a lot of people can't do that. So at least go to a multi-platform uh, type of scale, like a cat scale, and, and where you can uh, put your rig on different uh, pads and at least get an idea about, um, you know, where at least a general idea where your weight is. You want to adjust your tire pressure so that it, it works along with, so that it, it uh uh, you have enough uh, pressure in your tire to handle the weight. Um, so you want to take a look at that. There are weight um, and pressure charts that come with, uh, that are available online for most tires. And so once you know how much weight is on a particular axle, you can adjust the, um, the pressure for that. But again, it's a matter of not overloading the trailer or the RV, the motorhome. Uh, another thing that people do a lot of, and, and we've seen a lot of comments, we've gotten comments back, I've talked to people, people towing RVs the wrong way. So their trailer is nose up, nose down, uh, and especially if they're loaded, uh, what that's doing is overloading one of the axles. So, um, you know, again, a, a trailer, you know, an RV trailer, a tandem axle trailer is a, a bit of a balancing act. So uh, once you're up to, you know, closer to the gross vehicle weight of the trailer, uh, then you're getting closer to the axle capacities and the tire capacities and things like that. So if you're not towing at level, uh, you can overload that. It can cause tire wear or bent axles or uh, things like that. And we see, we get letters a lot in the magazine. Yeah, uh, and Chris, talking this is Jeff Johnston, and they, we just got another one in. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to him on the phone, and he was he was asking me about it. And, and many times with the tire issue, it's not just a an inconvenience to have a flat tire, but if you get a blowout, I mean, there are fatal consequences if things line up. Uh, yeah, I mean, theoretically, you, you could, uh, especially like a steer tire on a motorhome, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, trailer, it's more uh, property damage uh, that happens from it. Uh, when the, the carcass lets go, it, it hits things underneath. Uh, I've seen them rip floors out of RVs and yeah. plumbing and all kinds of stuff. If people keep driving. They don't know it. Um, you know, it has plenty of time for all that to, to hey, do Bob, some damage. Bob, I just, it, it, it needs to be said. Um, I've been looking for Kessler all show. He finally checked in. Hello, gang. Yeah. Got home from us. Hey, does, Rick. Does that... Does that officially count as attending the show if you're there with one minute when the show's got with to one minute, Rick, the show starts at 7 o'clock, not Eastern 8 o'clock. Eastern time. <laughs> Check so the tire Jason manufacturer. Use the tire manufacturer chart for pressure, not the trailer manufacturer. Chris Andrew says regular service and inspection is a must. Uh, Mark Polk says, check the tire manufacturer load and inflation tables to adjust inflation pressure to weights. Uh, when you throw all of that stuff in there, Chris, mm -hmm. and then you get a heat wave like we've got, and you're sitting up there at 100 degrees every day, and the asphalt is probably 120 or 130, and you decide to, you're going to really race to get the next campground, and you run this thing for six to seven hours, what's your advice there? So the pressure is not uh, an issue. So if you're running at um, the recommended pressure, the heat, uh, you know, your, your ambient heat, your road heat isn't going to create a, uh, an additional problem. One thing, though, that I do want to mention, um, and this is something a lot of people don't know, is that trailer tires, uh, some trailer tires don't have a speed rating, a, a posted speed rating. So 
if what does that mean chris so uh you look at different types of tires and they have speed ratings right so they're designed to um, be able to uh, stay within temperature and be able to handle the centrifugal forces and whatnot at a certain speed okay up to a certain speed okay. uh, but with uh, trailer tires if they're not tested and rated and, and indeed built for a higher speed then I believe the standard uh, uh, speed is 65 miles an hour. And so if you exceed that speed, which, you know, a lot of highways today, you have 70, uh, 75 mile an hour speed limits in some yep. places. Yep. Uh, so if you're going along at the speed limit, you're actually, um, you know, messing your tires up. And, and that can uh, contribute to uh, tire blowout. Um, and one, you know, one of the things too with, uh, you know, Take a look, see if you can find an inflation chart. Uh, I know there are some of the uh, Chinese tires that are coming out that don't have those charts. I, at least there's some I've, I can't find. I mean, I had a trailer that had accurate tires, A-K-U-R-E-T tires, and it was some- They can't, they can't even spell it right, huh? It, well, and they you know they went away pretty quickly, but um, in which they all blew out, by the way. Uh, but um, you know they weren't speed rated. And so I know I was, you know, I was pushing the envelope with them sometimes, but. Frank, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Frank says, has it been recommended to buy truck tires versus trailer tires? So if the tra if the truck tire has the same uh, characteristics as a trailer tire and, and it, as far as uh, load rating uh, and uh, scuff resistance, that's fine. Uh, but just you, you need to make sure that you're doing an apples to apples comparison between the two. And most people that I know um, have had good luck, you know, okay luck with that. It hasn't been an issue. They're more expensive. Uh, you know, trailer tires are built to handle that scuffing. If you ever watch a, a trailer and even in a yard or something or in a parking lot and somebody makes a real sharp turn, you'll see those axles bend. And you'll see those tires, they're really getting, you know, torqued as they turn around. And so your trailer tires for a, a given rating are designed to put up with uh, more and more of that. Uh, so you just want to make sure that whatever tires you put on there are going to be able to handle that. Great. Well, we are, we are pushed right up to 8 o'clock, and it's getting dark in Bellingham, I see. John's going to be working under the lights. So no weather yet. Chris, I want to thank you. No yeah. weather yet. No, no rain yet? No. Nope. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Chris is checking the weather map. Yeah, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the radar. It's coming. Okay. Well, I'm driving back to Washington right. now. Always a pleasure, Chris, uh, right. having you on the show. You always insightful and great conversation. Everybody we'll enjoyed again, it by Chris. the comments. So we'll meet again for bonus. We'll get back. Looking forward to it. And uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. It was great seeing everyone. Right. Thanks guys. See you later on right. down Take the care. road. See you All next right. week, everybody. Have a great day.